welcome everybody. Happy to be here with you today. And uh, I know I'm in the company of uh, probably a lot of uh, simulation users out there doing a lot of cool stuff with the programs. And uh, hopefully this will be beneficial to everyone and hopefully it'll be, we'll have some fun along in the process here. So uh, my name is Kurt. I've been with uh, CATI for, uh, I guess, and when the VAR, VAR reseller world since about 2005. Um, now with CATI and uh, been using the simulation product since about the 1999 or 2000 release. I can't really remember. It's been so long ago. But I've seen these uh, programs grow and uh, develop over the years and uh, got some great tools at our disposal and uh, happy to share some of the information today about uh, the stuff that maybe you, you might have missed and the new stuff that's come along over the years. So. Um, Let's kick into it. Uh, some of the goals for, for the presentation, I want to basically help you get a better awareness of some of the new functionality and encourage your use of it. And then just hopefully increase your confidence and productivity with the simulation, the validation tools in general. And if somewhere along the way you say either to yourself or out loud, I didn't know we could do that, that will make me very happy. So. Proceeding along, I want to show you where I cut my teeth uh, we, doing finite element analysis. Basically, we've come a long way. The, uh, what you see on the screen here is a large format camera in the shuttle payload bay that flew in 1984. Um, I worked on the, a, a second version of this uh, in a different orientation that was supposed to fly in 86, uh, but as you can, as you probably recall, we had the Challenger uh, tragedy during, during that interim time and that was shelved. So, but basically cut my teeth in the FEA analyzing the structure here that was supporting this very large and heavy camera. It weighed about, the, the whole assembly weighed about 3,400 pounds. And um, we've come a long way with the technology for photographs. This was a film camera. Now we can do the kind of high resolution stuff that was done with this camera with probably a three or four pound camera, not a 3,400 pound camera. So we've come a long way with uh, technology including simulation and what we do now with the, the pre and post processing are just super powerful, a lot of the visualization tools. Whereas back in the day, back when this thing was uh, analyzed, it was computer output looking at uh, lines of data getting forces and stresses and stuff out of the computer uh, that ran the simulation. So long way and uh, hopefully we can uh, keep on progressing with some good uh, improvements along the way. I want to take a quick poll before we get into the material here. I want to see where your experience level is. I'm going to open up this poll that you see here on the in the slideshow. So you should see within the, the meeting interface, um, you should see a polling that, that you have av available to you. Please, uh, yep, I see people responding to that. Got about 30 seconds to put your responses in. Wouldn't mind uh, humoring us with that. We're going to get an idea of what kind of experience level we have in the audience today. All right, some, some answers coming in. Very good. About five seconds and it'll shut down automatically. Three, two, one, here we go. All right, so let me show you the poll results. So it looks like we've got, um, you should be seeing the poll results. Chris, let me know if that's not the case. Um, we've got uh, some uh, some folks that have been using for quite a while. Like we got some uh, 2017 and older. Um, and then uh, quite a few that have not used the, the tools before. So uh, hopefully we can uh, encourage you folks that haven't used the tools before to, to start using it. And um, those that uh, have been with it since 2016 and older, I see there's five of you that have been with it that long. That's great. Um, let's see if I can shut this down, Chris. Let me figure out how to do that. Thanks for everyone's response with that. We'll move right along into the material here. And um, as, as you saw in the poll, what we're going to do, we're going to kind of focus on the last uh, five releases that you see here from 2016 and following. We're going to take a look at those, um, the results for that. So here's where we're headed with it. I want to first show you some numbers about uh, the functionality that has come along since 2016. We'll dive into the programs then. We'll look at the three programs you see here, and we'll look at some of that stuff that's come along and uh, call to action and some QA at the end there. 
And as Chris mentioned, just put your questions that you might have along the way in the chat, and we're happy to answer those towards the end. So first, by the numbers, I um, wanted to give you an idea of, of some of the, what we're dealing with here. We're looking at the three products, flows, uh, simulation, the FEA, flow simulation, the CFD tool, and then SOLIDWORKS Plastics, which is our injection molding simulation. I'm going to examine those five releases, as I mentioned. And from those five releases and those three products, we've seen a total of 117 enhancements come along. So quite a bit of material that's come along uh, since then. And don't worry, we're not going to show you all of them today. Hopefully I'll hit the, the good highlights. And uh, I want to send out some kudos to the Dassault simulation development and support teams. They've done a really great job, in my opinion, of keeping the program progressing and developing in a positive way and getting that uh, good new functionality out to everyone. So to get the numbers that I'm going to show you in a couple of bar graphs, I went to the help pull down menu in SOLIDWORKS and each of the releases and there's a what's new in there. There's a PDF document that you can access. You can go into any SOLIDWORKS installation and grab that PDF. So basically I did that for the last uh, five releases and I uh, took a look at the sections relevant to simulation, flow, and plastics, and I basically just looked at all the bullet lists in, in those chapters. So for instance, for SOLIDWORKS simulation, I came up with these four categories, and I grouped those bullets, all the bullets, 117 of them, categories that I came up with. So this is nothing from SOLIDWORKS. It's all pretty much my, my judgment on what was what, and some of them kind of overlapped couple of categories. So as you see there, there's uh, the categories that we're going to be looking at, and I'll show you the numbers now. So of the 117 total enhancements across the board, we had a, uh, an interface change for SOLIDWORKS in general in 2016, and so I think a lot of uh, focus was on that. And then you see 2017, 30 enhancements came along <coughs> for the validation tools dropped off in the next couple of years, and then in 2020, the latest release, we've gotten uh, 26 into the mix there. So looking at those in terms of those categories, you kind of see an overlay here. So you see pretty strong categories of user interface improvements and ease of use developments, some solver improvements there. So kind of across the board, a good, good range of development with a really strong emphasis on the ease of use and just making it better and, and more straightforward for all users. <clears throat> Before I break it down per product, I want to roll out another poll here. And if you could tell me which, if you have used the validation tools, which do you use the most? So I've got that open now. You've got about 30 seconds to give me some responses there. Appreciate the feedback. <clears throat> all the work simulation is coming along strong there. 30% or so, now it's getting even higher. I don't see any f votes for flow yet. Okay, 10 seconds left. So a couple of plastics users there, that's good, a few of those. Looks like the lion's share is basically in simulation, so show those results to you. So real strong showing for the simulation side, the FEA side on SOLIDWORKS simulation. A handful of plastic users and no flow simulation users in the house. So I think uh, if you haven't used flow before, when the material that I'm going to show you, I think it will uh, inspire you to go at least check it out. All right, very good. Thank you for that input. I appreciate that. I'll stand by saving those results here. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and, and look into the levels per product. So here you see the breakdown and uh, the numbers related to SOLIDWORKS simulation are the highest, and that seems to be the most commonly used validation tool, and that's confirmed in the poll that you just took. So good stuff there. And breaking that into the categories again, uh, the simulation FEA very strong in the first three categories. The ease of use across the board is very strong. So. Just kind of give, should give you a little bit of an overview of uh, the distribution of those uh, enhancements. <laughs> All right, so let's proceed with uh, the cool stuff, as it were. So I'm going to show you the three products, and uh, we'll start off with um, the SOLIDWORKS Plastics tool first. 
So I'll give you a little bit about the lineage and the history of that program, then uh, look at study management improvements. We'll jump into the program and show you the, the, the cool new stuff. And if you see the, the parentheses indicates the year that these, these uh, enhancements came into play. And you'll notice that for plastics, it's the last couple of releases that I've listed there. And the reason for that, if you look into the lineage and the history, the program was purchased uh, by Dassault in 2012 uh, from a company called Simpo, a French company. It was uh, literally uh, the groundbreaking of uh, you know this kind of functionality for the SolidWorks users. A lot of uh, things were needed to be standardized to bring it into the look and feel of SolidWorks, and that happened in 2016. Since 2016, they really worked uh, diligently to bring things in even to more consistency. And as a result, the 2020 release had to be sort of a sort of a new new build, if you will. And so, that as a result of that significant change, if you open up a plastics simula simulation within 2020 that was created in a previous release. You'll only, be able to, you'll only be able to look at the results. You won't be able to edit any of that. You'd have to create new, new projects. So just keep that in mind when you're running 2020, any kind of a legacy file, you'll be able to view it only. So that's the significance of the change, and here's, here's a couple of examples of that in terms of study management for SOLIDWORKS plastics. Across the board for the other programs, for instance, SOLIDWORKS Simulation, we've always had a consistent command manager tab with the ability to create a new study right there in the top left-hand corner. You create that study, you, you give it a name, you select, select the study type, and off you go. Uh, Flow Simulation has been the same. We have a couple of ways to create a new project within Flow, either using the wizard or just generating a new project on the fly. And so finally for plastics in 2020 that has come into play now we can we have uh, the ability to pick the uh, icon generate the study and pick the type of um, characteristics that we're dealing with in the, the solid or, or shell type analysis and off we go so we've got that good consistency now there and a lot of other things within that command manager that really help things move right along we now have we now have tutorials within plastics we didn't have any before 2020 now we have nine so you can cover everything from basic filling to the cooling and warpage right there in those tutorial files a very comprehensive tutorial grouping there and the help file has been really enhanced greatly improved lots of extra detail in there that we didn't have before and uh, so we're in really good shape with uh, the plastics so let's jump into that and uh, take a look see what we have here. Let me jump into SolidWorks and let's fire up that little handle that you saw in the little preview. So with uh, the add-ins, as you know, we have the, the analysis tools in our add-ins list right here. So we'll turn on plastics first. We'll get that fired up. And what I want to show you basically is the, the basic setup for a plastics analysis. Since everything is pretty new here with this new interface, there again, I mentioned we've got the, the new study tab, the icon for it in the command manager right here. We basically give our study a name to talk about the type of analysis that we want to do, and off we go. We get that, that study set up right there on the fly, and we basically can just step down the list like I like to do with other simulation programs. We also have the command manager up here for accessibility of those things as well. What I want to do first is just step down through here and this, this new concept, uh, if you've used the older programs, we now have this new concept called domains and we group domains and so we basically tell the program, okay, that, that part is a metal insert, this part here that I just uh, picked to designate that, it's, a, it's an, an insert over molding, so that part is going to be the insert. Here's the plastic part domain, I'll call that the cavity. And then here I've got the built-in CAD modeled uh, runner system out here. And so you see all of those items have been properly designated right there within the start. So I've got a runner system and the CAD so I don't have to designate one virtually here. I'm going to go in straight away into the cooling channel. So for the cooling channel I can tell the program I've got these sketches that I want you to use. 
So I'll pick those two sketches and I'll set up some sizing information for those cooling channels and then assign those. And we see we get that right away. We're ready to go with our cooling channel. <laughs> Last thing I need is a virtual mold. So I'll just tell the program the size of that mold, just like with other with our with our flow simulation tool, we can resize that on the fly with drag and drop. I've got everything I need here to start uh, the, the rest of the setup with boundary conditions and then solve the problem. Um, I do want to go ahead and uh, show you that. I'll show you a few of these. So first, the injection location. I'm going to go ahead and pick that top of that runner system there. You can tell it uh, what our uh, if, if, if we use either the geometry face or a point on the model. Before, with previous releases, we had to pick a point that represented one of the mesh nodes. Now we can just tell it that geometry face is what I want to use. And we don't have to worry about if we have to, if we remesh things. Go ahead and just hide this uh, mold domain there. And then moving right along with the boundary conditions, we'll put some cooling information in here. So we've got all these other things we can do. For the sake of this, I'll just show you the coolant input. And there again, these are represented by these sketches. So I'll show this upper sketch and uh, tell it where the, the flow, coolant flow is coming in. Toggle the next field, and there's the exit. So just, just like that, we can set those up very quickly. The, um, the mesh is, is straightforward as well. And this has been great, greatly um, improved. Before this release, we had about a six-step process to get our solid mesh generated. And you'll notice this is much quicker. We have just a two-step process now. So I'm going to go ahead and use the defaults for the surface mesh. Looks OK. And then move on into the second and final step and just create the solid mesh from that. You, there again, using defaults, we have the ability to control um, the, the mesh quality in areas. And when we get our solid mesh, we automatically get a section clipped view of that. So you can see we've got a really good solid mesh there that captures our insert, our part, mold, and cooling channel very well. So that's pretty much the, the what's new for plastics. If I jump over to a solved, a solved configuration, I can show you those results very quickly here. Let that project load up. There again, if you have any questions along the way, I know it's going to come kind of fast. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out in the chat there, and we'll answer those. When this is loading up. Let's see what I may have. Oh, here we go. Let's go ahead and show it real quick. Here's our flow results. And if you haven't seen the flow, um, the flow field for the plastics is quite impressive. You can see where things, how things fill, where we might have a, a problem with weld lines, that kind of thing. So once this comes up, you can animate that process. I can show. Uh, ISO surface mode of that, so you can see it filling around that insert very nicely. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump into the next section We've uh, so we can keep moving along here. All right, so I showed you all that information with the domains, the geometry-based boundary conditions, the mesh generation, and the coolant input. All right, so let's jump into flow simulation. I think uh, this is one where we did not have any any users yet on Flow, but like I say, hopefully you'll you'll uh, see some good stuff here that you can use. We've got some functionality that came in 2016 where we can import the properties of sunlight that would have been set up in the CAD side. We have a multi-parametric optimization tool that came in in the following year, and then in 2019 we have a heat flux plot. So let's go ahead. Um, oh, and then after that, I'm going to show you uh, sur the free surface functionality that came in in 2018 that's been much, uh, much sought after by the users. I'll get back to this. Let me uh, jump into the program and show you the other stuff first. We have this new um, welcome icon here that came in a couple of re releases ago that allows you to quickly get to files. All right, so here we are with a little solar cooker that uh, came up with with my sons a couple of years back. We did some 
backyard solar cooking, and uh, it worked quite well. We we actually melted some of the plastic that was in inside there with um, to divide the, the the different sections of the of the ch cook chamber. So you'll see a lower cook chamber here, and I've got a a part here that I'm going to focus on to try to heat up. And then you've got the, the solar collector with the reflective surfaces up here, and then a transparent opening. These two, this surface and this surface are both transparent so that sunlight can come in. We have black, um, black body type radiation absorption within the cook chamber. So this uh, little model worked really well, and it shows the sunlight import quite well also. Uh, let me go ahead and take plastics out of the mix here and uh, turn on flow sim. I like the way we can now toggle those add-ins right there on the command manager, so that's very powerful. Before I jump into the flow side, let me show you an animation of the sunlight. So this is um, turned on real view with shadows. You'll see that I've got this animation in here of an overhead sunlight that comes in that's represented um, the location represents the city of Chicago, and I believe as you look over here to the right, you can see where that is there, the location, and this is uh, around Memorial Day. Uh, so this is approximate uh, sun angle and, and intensity at Chicago on Memorial Day. And that animation shows that shadow moving along as the day progresses starting at 10 a.m. for two hours till noon. All right, so jumping back over into the into the model side of things and into flow simulation. What we can do with flow simulation, uh, what I if I look at the general settings here, and there again some of this might might be brand new if we haven't used it, but look in here, we can see that we've got uh, the ability to turn on heat conduction in solids. So I'm looking at the heat transfer, and I'm also turning on radiation. And I have the ability to either do the radiation from the ambient environment or direct from the, the model sunlight. So you'll notice that uh, I've picked the model sunlight from the SOLIDWORKS side, but we have these other, other abilities here to other ways we can turn on the solar radiation. So it's getting the information that I set up over on the SOLIDWORKS side, and you'll see that over here in the tree. There's our model sunlight, and there again, it's uh, set up to um, be in, at Chicago at uh, 10 a.m. starting time. So that's been around for a while. Now we're able to leverage that with flow simulation. You can see the sun. All right. Looking at this uh, over in Flow Sim, let's go ahead and uh, check out some of the results here and dive into that. I've got um, a lot of uh, the information exposed here about the setup. We won't go into the details of that. We don't really have time for that. But if I look at the results here, I've got a, um, a really nice way of looking at transient results, which, I'm, which I've done for this particular project. It's a two-hour transient simulation. You see our timeline down here, 7,200 seconds. And if I show my surface plot and then animate that, you'll see that uh, that shadow, that sunlight, as it moves, the sun moves across the sky, that shadow moves. And this is our cooler area here that's in the shadow of the box. And then the hotter area surround it, you can see that move along like it did in our, in our animation there. All right, so that's our transient simulation of that. And I also have a cut plot in here. Let me look at it from the side view. And I'm going to show that cut plot. And you'll see that I uh, didn't mean to edit it. I meant to hide it. All right, showing that. And we can um, go into the Flow Command Manager tab and just hide the geometry quickly. And you'll see that we've got the we've got the 
uh, swirling of the air flow that's contained in these compartments and then the rising of the, the heat due to the convection. And if I play this, that is also animated quite well. And you can see our little cook area here getting heated up quite nicely. We're at the top range of 200 degrees F. So in case you're wondering, if I look at uh, sort of a surface plot here, I can turn the geometry back on. You can see that I've got this 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 ground level thing here that is not any there's no color coding on that. The reason for that with flow simulation we're solving for a particular domain. That's the size of the the volume that we're solving for. That's contained everything that's contained within there is is taking is getting that information. So there again with that cut cut plot, you can see that it's contained within it as well. So that's flow simulation sort of uh Quick, a quick view of it on a, on a simulation that involves sunlight. Now, one of the really cool things that we can do with this program, I'm going to unload these results and I'm going to jump into a steady state solution that was run uh, with that sunlight at a steady state at, at high noon. So we want to see how well we heat up that, that, the uh, volume of that food in there. Maybe it's a rack of, of uh, hot dogs for our, our Memorial Day picnic. So look, there again, looking at that, that cutaway here, that cut view, I've got some goals in here that I'm going to solve for. And one of them is the average temperature of that, sec that uh, block of food there. And you can see it's kind of su suspended there in, between, in, the, in the box. And the box itself is suspended over the slab. And the reason for this uh, suspension is that, as I sh I'll show you here in a little bit, I'm going to have the program automatically come up with the angle of, of rotation, simulating that maybe this is on some type of a rack that can be oriented to get the best view of that, that sunlight input. And then, you know, I've got maybe some type of a rack that this food is sitting on. It's not going to be directly on the bottom of that. So with that in mind, if I look at my, uh, my results for this steady state uh, at, at high noon within the this design optimization tool here, I can tell what the, that best, the best angle is going to be. Let's see if I have, before I do that, let's see if I have a solution. I don't remember if I have results loaded for this. Looks like I do. So I've got a steady state, 12, a high noon um, solution here. I'm going to collapse the input. Let's get down to results here. And I've got those plots in here. This one needs to be edited, it looks like. Showing me the mesh right now. Okay, so it is just the mesh. So I haven't solved this one for this specific time step. But what I did was, within this design of experiments, I've got the, uh, I've got the solution for all those, for some variable uh, angles and variable sizing of the box. Let me see if I can demonstrate that here. So this functionality allows us to do several things. I can do a what-if analysis, and I, I can vary things along the way and show the combination of those and results. I can do a goal optimization. I can vary one thing and, and, and have it target a specific goal and tell me where that, what that variable needs to be. What I've done is I've done a, a design of experiments optimization. So this allows me to set up several different uh, parameters for my input variables and come up with uh, an optimal design point for that, leveraging the design of experiments itself. So what I have in here is I've got this angle of the solar of an assembly relative to the slab here. Right now, it's shown at zero degrees. I'm going to allow that to go up to 10 degrees. Then I've got a, the size of the box. The box itself, I've, I've allowed it to go from 8 to 12 inches on the height of this box here. So those two variables can be can be tweaked with the design of experiments method and come up with the, the, the maxim, to maximize the average temperature of that, that the uh, food that I'm, that I'm cooking in there. Here's the scenario. Here's what it did. I allowed it to have 10 experiments using those variables. And you can see the two variables here, the, uh, the angle and then the, the distance. So you'll see the range 
within those that I showed you on the other screen. And this is these are solved um, projects here, and there's the average temperature for each of those combinations along the way. So right now, looking at this, finding the highest sort of manually, I've got a 249 here uh, with, with this design point. What I can do now is I can go over to my, my um, experiments uh, section here, and I can tell it to find the optimal design point for me. This is where we tell it the objective, objective functions. In this case, the only thing I really want to do is just maximize that average temperature. I want to maximize that objective, objective function. I can have more in here, and I can weight them accordingly. So go ahead and add that optimal design point. And as you might expect, it's going to be the, the steepest angle, that 10 degree angle, if you look at the orientation of the sun here. You want it to be tilted more directly to that, so the maximum was 10 that I allowed, and then the smallest box at uh, 8 inches tall. So that tells me it's going to be about a 250 degree temperature, average temperature of that, of that food in there. And that, that is our optimal design point. I can look at that graph, excuse me, graphically with the response surface plot here. And if, I, if I show that, you can see average temperature of the solid of the food. Here's that highest point that it, that it calculated, that 249. This one over here is the, the height of the reflector, this axis, and then we've got the angle here. So looks like our, our design point is here at this point, the, the highest angle and the smallest, um, the smallest size of the box. So that's our design of experiments method. Quite powerful. We can do multiple variables in here with this. And uh, at this point, I could say, go ahead and create a project. Create a full project for me so I can solve this thing. And what it's going to do is this is a warning that it's going to set all those parameters to whatever this is dictating right here. So I'll say yes, and it'll create that project for me. And there's our angle and our short box, you can see. So at this point, I'm done with that design of experiments, and I can run this project now and get the full solution for that, that orientation and that size. Super powerful. Um, definitely make use of that if you, uh, if you need to do some design optimization. Um, let's see where we are in the timing. I think we're pretty good here. I wanted to show you a couple more things on that. Um, the... Uh, some of the, the items in here for the, the setup of this, just to kind of give you a little more of an overview. General settings in here for things like uh, what's my fluid, uh, we're using uh, air, what are the, what's the general solid material. Solid is aluminum, and you saw over here that I've, I've over, over, I can override that with other items that are different material. And we have uh, initial conditions in here. So lots of uh, good functionality within that project. Let me switch over and see and show you a, um, another one that's related to that hydraulic jump. Let's go ahead and cancel the save of that. Oh, I guess before I do that, I can show you that heat flux plot. I'll fire that back up over here. With this type of a plot, <coughs> This is based on what you just saw in that solar oven. So you've got radiation quantities in yellow, and then you've got some uh, conductive and convective heat, fl heat plots as well. So the, the fluid subdomain is taking 302 watts directly from the solid, and it's taking uh, from the ground is taking 890. So you can see where the heat is moving within the, the project that you've set up. 13 watts going directly into the food source. So that's the, the flux plot. Let me show you the free surface, the other new, new functionality that came in 2018 with flow simulation. So there again, this is another uh, flow project, and it is an external flow problem. It's solving for the, the volume that you see here. I've got the, the channel, a, a flow channel shown here with the blue areas being um, designators where I'm starting with fluid, with water in the, in the domain. 
as you see here, these initial conditions, these are starting out with water. And at the bottom of this one, I'm bring, introducing an inlet flow, 0 0.01 cubic meters per second. So it's going to push that water up and over the ramp and down and spill into this existing pool and then over the edge here. So the um, free surface is a transient solution. So once we turn that on, we set up our time dependence for our so, uh, to solve this problem. And once we get things set up with uh, goals and uh, let's see what else, uh, some goals related to total pressure, max flow rate, max velocity. And I'll show you in a minute, the, this type of a solution needs a little bit more control on the mesh. It needs a lot, a lot finer mesh. Actually, I can show you right here with this plot, load my results here. So this is the 10 second time of the solution, as you see here. I solved from zero to 10 seconds with it starting with that level just below the, the ramp there at 10 seconds. And quickly showing you the mesh. This is a, a refinement level that's required to capture that, that free surface. And you can see we've got a really fine control there. So that's one of the requirements of this if you, if you get into it. And uh, let's look at that plot. So I've got a nice plot here of the ISO surface which shows me the volume fraction of water with velocity overlaid on the top of that, on that surface. So you can see we've got very stagnant condition here. It's simply coming up and then it's flowing down. So I get an increase in the velocity. And then you can see how the hydraulic jump has formed here and then spilling over the other edge and the velocity there. <laughs> So this one, this one has been a long time in coming where we can do this type of a, of a, uh, of a calculation. And uh, you can do a lot of things with this. You can you know, let your imagination run. We can have flow out of a nozzle. So for instance, uh, simulate a fire hose and how that, where that uh, flow stream goes out of a nozzle. We can do um, simulate boats on the water with it. I haven't done that myself, but I know that there's been some solutions of boats traveling through the water with the waves and everything. So this is basically the cut plot of the volume fraction of water. So everything that's red is water. Everything that's blue is air with the streamlines overlaid on that. So you can see the recirculation as the flow develops and moves along. One of my favorites, uh, if you probably couldn't tell. Um, so let's see, what else do I need to show you on this? Oh yeah, I want to show you within the um, within the slideshow the animated or this step-by-step -step plots here. The animation of them real time it takes a little while to rebuild. So I'll show you on uh, uh, intervals here. So here's our t equals one second. We're just starting to get flow over the the ramp here, and there's two seconds later we've flown down and we started to we started to make the uh, interaction with the standing pool. At five seconds, our hydra hydraulic jump is starting to form here. You can see the turbulence there that dissipating that energy. And then five or seven seconds, now it's pretty much fully developed. And with nine seconds, you'll see that it doesn't really move. It, it's pretty stationary. So that is um, the free surface capability within flow simulation where we can do things uh, like simulate the hydraulic jump. All right. Let's move into simulation, the FEA program where most of you have uh, the experience with. Um, a new thing that came out this, this release is the simulation evaluator. I'll show you that. And then we'll jump into the program and show you a hotspot, stress hotspot detection tool. And then an enhancement to that in 2018 was the singularity check. And then I'll also show you a topology study new for 2018. This is where we're dipping into some of the Simulia technology, Dassault Systems Advanced Simulation uh, is where, we're, where we've gotten this, this capability to do a, a topology study within our simulation tool. All right, so, um, oh, and if I have time at the end here, I'll show you some bonus material uh, outside the range of our uh, 
releases that we're looking at. 2015, a uh, new functionality came out then that's super important. So I'll show you that towards the end here. Jumping into this thing we call the Simulation Evaluator with the FEA tool, came out in 2020. Basically, it checks some things related to, checks three things, uh, where your results are coming from, where they're stored, if you have enough memory in the storage location, your materials, if everything's been assigned uh, a material, and then a, a quality check that looks at the mesh volume versus the part volume. So the way this works is you, you start it up, and here's an example where I, I move some things around after I made a solution and the results got disconnected from the, the study itself. And so you can basically see that this thing called a CWR file cannot be read or it, or it appears to be missing. So a little background information, the CWR file is uh, the compressed results file. When you run a simulation and then you save that file and close it, all of those multiple simulation results files get compressed and put into this CWR. So if you want to share a file that you've run a simulation with, if you want to share that with someone, you copy that file or the assembly and its reference files and the CWR file, and then you can copy that wherever you want and then open up those results without having to rerun it. Well, I did that. I ran a solution and I, I, I moved it. And I put in a new new location. I put the results into this CWR folder that I like to use to keep things kind of tidy. And uh, lo and behold, when I opened the file in the new location, I couldn't find it. So it's like, okay, well, to edit you, right here, you can edit the study properties to change the result folder. Did that. Okay, it found it. We're good. And let's go ahead and validate that. Validate the the uh, program to to link it to that again. After taking that step, you get the green check, all is good. So that's a, just the one, the, the top level results section of that, of that uh, file, the, uh, the Explorer. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, jump into the program. I'll get back to this topology once we show you some things in the program. Let's jump into, I've got a little, uh, Mike Crank, uh, I don't know if we have any cyclists out there. I'm an avid cyclist. I'm pretty slow, but I like to, to do road and uh, mountain biking. And this, if uh, you're familiar with cycling, this is a clip-in type pedal. And uh, very dangerous to use from the start if you've never ridden a bike with clip-in pedals. Uh, I can uh, attest that uh, I embarrassed myself the first time I rode my bike with one of these with the, these pedals on on the bike where you're literally clipped in and you can't release until you slide your your heel outward to to come out of that clip. So lots of fun there learning to use these pedals. So what I want to show you on this is um, I want to show you the uh, couple of the functionalities related to finding hotspots. So we've got this full system here. I also want to show you uh, a load simplification. So if, if I want to an analyze this, this crank assembly here, uh, and I don't, don't really care about the pedal because that's an off-the-shelf item. It's rated for whatever a rider will put on it. I can replace that with what's called a remote load that came into play some time ago that's uh, super powerful. So let me go ahead and uh, back into my add-ins, take flow out of the mix, and don't need photo view anymore. That was part of that animation that we did on that um, solar cooker. Turn on the simulation FEA tool. And we'll get our simulation tab here. There's my study icon to create a new study. I'm just going to dive in and show you um, the study that I've, I've, a couple of studies that I've created here. So I've got this one study down here that's called with chain rings. I pick on that tab and so simulation leverages configuration. So you'll notice I've got two configurations here. This study was, this study was set up with in relation to this, this uh, no pedal configuration. Well, I can quickly toggle over to it by activating it, and you'll see the pedal disappears, and I have the replacement of that is a remote load out here. That's what's going on with this. And double-clicking that, should be able to double-click. There we are. 
and you can edit that right there on the fly. Um, so this shows you the setup of that. I've got uh, the face of the crank arm there where that's applied to. And then I'm using a local coordinate system here to orient that properly. Give it the orientation, the, the load out there. I've got 175 downward, 175 pound downward load as you see here. And uh, a new functionality that came into play as well is this used to be strictly rigid, a rigid connection where the, it would stiffen everything that it was connected to, so there was no flexibility in this face here at all. And that's not always the case. You can have a distributed connection type now where you can get a more accurate behavior of, of those uh, remote loads. And that, that has been applied to things like pins and, uh, and bolts as well. A couple of things looking at this tree here. Uh, we've got some new, a new icon here that shows what's going on with the, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. See if I can zoom in here. Yeah, so we've got a new icon there that shows that it's, it's giving me information about the mesh quality here. Now for 2020, we can mix mesh types. Draft and high quality can exist in the same simulation. That's um, that's pretty powerful to reduce the overhead. Uh, as you may know, the, the um, high quality elements, uh, tetrahedral elements, have 10 nodes per element. The draft quality have four, so you can get a great reduction in the, the complexity and the overhead of your, of your model you know, with, with togging those over where areas where you may not need it. Um, let's see, we've got, uh, I showed you the remote load there. The simulation evaluator that I showed you on the slideshow is, is accessed right here within a right click. Just taking a quick peek at that for this one. Results are green check mark. We're good. It can find those results. Uh, materials have been applied to everything, so we're good. We've got some carbon steel and some, and some uh, aluminum. You can see the properties are right there straight away when we hover over that. And then finally, the mesh volume check our difference between our model and our simulation finite element model is uh, quite low, so we're good there. So that looks good. We can close that and proceed. One thing that you'll notice with uh, simulation, the tree can get kind of busy uh, as you get a lot of parts and a lot of things going on here. Uh, new for 2020, a shift C will collapse that tree collapse everything, so that's quite handy to, to keep things tidy over there on the, the, the property manager. Let's see, another thing that we can do, we can look at mass properties now as well. So uh, we've had this avail ability before with, uh, the, on the Evaluate tab up here on the SOLIDWORKS side, we've been able to do mass properties right here. But this is reflective of what's going on in the geometry. And if I make changes in here to density and whatnot, then this, this is going to update it. And I can get the actual mass properties for the project based on the materials that I've got here. So that's quite a quite powerful addition as well, especially when it comes to the topology stuff that I'll show you in a little bit. Um, all right, let's uh, let's show you this, the the rest of the setup here. I've got um, the remote load. I've got the fixtures applied here. Some appropriate fixtures to simulate where the chain is is resisting that torque uh, from the pedal action. Uh, let's jump into results here. Here's my stress plot, and you see there uh, the contours for stress. One of the relatively new things that we can do is change our upper bound here. We can put in whatever we want in this area here. Maybe I want to round it off to the to the 20,000 number. I can also have it show me the the high, the max, and the minimum. It's it's toggled on right now. There's a maximum. I can turn that off right there. So lots of control here as well to do a right click and get to a lot of the functionality that I, that I can do over in the on the icon for the plot itself. I can toggle the mesh on and off right here as well. So lots of control that's been added over here to the color bar. Reset this back to where it was with that little icon right there. All right, so let me make sure I cover the rest of this here before we 
we'll wrap it up here in about 10 minutes or less. Um, one of the things we can do now, I can actually delete a study without activating it. You can see when I clicked on that, on this delete study tab here, it did not activate that study. So that's important if you have a lot of, of uh, studies that have a lot of results, a lot of uh, degrees of freedom. Sometimes it can bog things down when, a, when you pick on that to delete it. Now it'll delete straight away. Let's see, we've got, uh, let's jump over to this particular tab here. I've got the, the single part isolated here. I wanted to show you the, the hotspot detection tool. So right now this is set up in a similar way. I've just restrained it in a, in a way here in this center hub that is going to induce some stress concentration. I've got that face there that's, that's been fixed or res it's resisting most of that torque load. So if I look at the, the stress on that, you'll notice that's where my maximum indicator is. Let me turn off the mesh view here. My maximum is shown there, but if that little icon is not toggled on, you may not know it's there. The, the support, the restraint icons are kind of covering up. I can say, okay, it's, it's looking good, it's maximum there. But if I zoom in, you see I've got a kind of a highly, highly loaded element in there. So it's a single element that's really taken the brunt of all that. So let's check to see if that's a true hotspot using this new tool or if it's a true uh, singularity point. So I can run that tool here with a right click. Hotspot Diagnostics. I have a sensitivity factor that I can set here. Let's use the defaults. Let's run it. And it's telling me, yeah, you've got a hotspot. Okay to that. And then I can tell the program to isolate the hotspot. And if I zoom into that, you'll see there's my hotspot in that, that problem area with that really kind of a poorly restrained uh, face. And further, the, the addition to that that came out the following year that the hotspot came into play was this singularity diagnosis. Well, singularity can exist where you have a sharp corner like we have in that, in that spline area. So I'm going to run this with defaults, and it basically refines the mesh a couple of times here. You see in the, the uh, property manager, it makes a couple of refinements, and it, does, uh, re it resolves the model and then it'll check to see if this stress is diverging or not. And it said, yeah, you've got a stress singularity. Okay to that. And here's my area where that singularity exists. There's my, my sharp edge where I have that discontinuity. And here's how things have diverged, diverged for me. If it was not a singularity, we'd see it level off. So that is our hotspot and singularity. Um, let's jump into, let me show you the topology on the, in the slideshow here since I kind of run a little bit short, only have a few minutes. Topology uh, will give us the ability to come up with the optimal sh shape of a part. You'll notice I've got the outline of my initial part here with just a crude block. I restrain this, um, let me show in my pointer here. I restrain this point in the middle here, and I put a side load in this case, and this is what it came up with for this load case to optimize the geometry. The uh, upward load here gave me this geometry, and if I tell the program to consider both load cases, it'll do that, and it's not strictly a combination of those two. It's not just an overlay, as you can tell. So that's our optimized uh, geometry for both load cases. And um, if I show inside of SolidWorks, I've got a model that shows that pretty well. This right here. Here's a little bracket that I set up and um, I just made a generic shape that I needed to have for resisting this static load, I'm, I'm pushing up here with a thousand pounds, and then I'm restraining uh, normal to the faces here, and I've got a, a, hinge, a fixed hinge here. So I want to see what that looks like. And then the optimized version of that to reduce the material by at least 30%. 
resulted in this shape. So you can see it's more of an organic kind of a shape, but I can then take this and overlay using my functionality in here for um, overlaying the stress results on the part level. If I go to the model tab, I can tell the program overlay the simulation display on here so that I can make some changes and come up with um, with a, a better geometry. So with that overlaid, I can then cut away from the original geometry the stuff that's blue, that's that's less uh, less needed material, as you saw in that uh, topology study. So very nice functionality to give you some good uh, organic type designs and. You know, with our metal 3D printers now, you can really come up with some really great, um, great uh, parts, even even in in metal that can be printed on the on the 3D printers. So, definitely some good stuff there. So I showed you um, information about the hot spots and the topology. Uh, here's the bonus material. We got just a couple of minutes here. I don't want to keep you too long, but if I told you that I could come up with a if I, I could use this part, this empty part that has only sketches and an axis, if I told you that I could come up with this result for that, would you think that I was lying? Would you believe me? Well, the bottom line is, yes, we can do that. We can generate a 2D simplification study from only sketches within a part file or um, yeah, I got a part file with multiple sketches. So this is our 2D simplification tool. It's uh, quite useful for doing plane stress, plane strain, and in the case of the seals axisymmetric type of uh, geometry. We've got uh, the section plane, which is where all the sketches are on that front plane, and the axis of symmetry. So going back one slide there, there you see the, uh, the result. So quite powerful. Um, I'll throw up a, a poll here as I get to the last slide here, one last poll, and if you wouldn't mind answering this one. Give me some feedback if you would, 30 seconds to, uh, did you see something new? Let me know, respond if you would. A couple of them, yeah, okay, the, the yes is racking up here, very good. 11, not, nice. Okay, 10 seconds left. Put your vote in, please. Very good. Yeah, we've got uh, quite a few, quite a few. So I'm showing 13. There we go. Yeah, show you the results. There's your results. So one person didn't get something new. 13 did, so that's I think that's pretty good. All right, um, close out the poll and finish up here. I've shown you some things related to the Improvements for 2016 through 2020 release of plastics and flow simulation and uh, simulation FEA. And sounds like some folks saw some things that they didn't know we could do, and that's good. So a call to action for you. I know what you have access to. Some of this stuff is uh, available at the advanced levels of simulation. Dig into your license and ask us uh, as your reseller what you might have. Maybe you're missing something. Learn something new out there in the simulation world and apply it. And then there's the uh, poll. Thank you for doing that. And uh, Chris, did we get any? Well, there's my contact information, folks. Um, it's been a pleasure spending some time with you. I hope uh, it's been a good experience for you.